This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, February 15, 1907. Chapters from my autobiography. Chapter 12. By Mark Twain. Orion Clemens resumed. Dictated April 5, 1906. There were several candidates for all the offices in the gift of the new State of Nevada, save two, United States Senator and Secretary of State. Nye was certain to get a senatorship, and Orion was so sure to get the secretaryship that no one but him was named for that office. But he was hit with one of his spasms of virtue on the very day that the Republican Party was to make its nominations in the convention, and refused to go near the convention. He was urged, but all persuasions failed. He said his presence there would be an unfair and improper influence, and that if he was to be nominated the compliment must come to him as a free and unspotted gift. This attitude would have settled his case for him without further effort, but he had another attack of virtue on the same day. That made it absolutely sure. It had been his habit for a great many years to change his religion with his shirt, and his ideas about temperance at the same time. He would be a teetotaler for a while, and the champion of the cause. Then he would change to the other side for a time. On nomination day he suddenly changed from a friendly attitude toward whiskey, which was the popular attitude, to uncompromising teetotalism, and went absolutely dry. His friends besought and implored, but all in vain. He could not be persuaded to cross the threshold of a saloon. The paper next morning contained the list of chosen nominees. His name was not in it. He had not received a vote. His rich income ceased when the state government came into power. He was without an occupation. Something had to be done. He put up his sign as attorney at law, but he got no clients. It was strange. It was difficult to account for. I cannot account for it. But if I were going to guess at a solution, I should guess that by the make of him he would examine both sides of the case so diligently and so conscientiously that when he got through with his argument neither he nor a jury would know which side he was on. I think that his client would find out his make in laying his case before him, and would take warning and withdraw it in time to save himself from probable disaster. I had taken up my residence in San Francisco about a year before the time I have just been speaking of. One day I got a tip from Mr. Camp, a bold man who was always making big fortunes in ingenious speculations, and losing them again in a course of six months by other speculative ingenuities. Camp told me to buy some shares in the Hale and Norcross. I bought fifty shares at three hundred dollars a share. I bought on a margin and put up twenty per cent. It exhausted my funds. I wrote Orion and offered him half, and asked him to send his share of the money. I waited and waited. He wrote and said he was going to attend to it. The stock went along up pretty briskly. It went higher and higher. It reached a thousand dollars a share. It climbed to two thousand, then to three thousand, then to twice that figure. The money did not come, but I was not disturbed. By and by that stock took a turn and began to gallop down. Then I wrote urgently. Orion answered that he had sent the money long ago, said he had sent it to the Occidental Hotel. I inquired for it. They said it was not there. To cut a long story short, that stock went on down until it fell below the price I had paid for it. Then it began to eat up the margin, and when at last I got out I was very badly crippled. When it was too late I found out what had become of Orion's money. Any other human being would have sent a check, but he sent gold. The hotel clerk put it in the safe and went on vacation. And there it had reposed all this time enjoying its fatal work, no doubt. Another man might have thought to tell me that the money was not in a letter, but was in an express package, but it never occurred to Orion to do that. Later Mr. Camp gave me another chance. He agreed to buy our Tennessee land for two hundred thousand dollars, pay a part of the amount in cash, and give long notes for the rest. His scheme was to import foreigners from grape-growing and wine-making districts in Europe, settle them on the land, and turn it into a wine-growing country. He knew what Mr. Longworth thought of those Tennessee grapes, and was satisfied. I sent the contracts and the things to Orion for his signature, and he being one of the three heirs. But they arrived at a bad time, in a doubly bad time, in fact. The temperance virtue was temporarily upon him in strong force, 
and he wrote and said that he would not be a party to debauching the country with wine. Also, he said, how could he know whether Mr. Camp was going to deal fairly and honestly with those poor people from Europe or not? And so, without waiting to find out, he quashed the whole trade, and there it fell, never to be brought to life again. The land, from being suddenly worth two hundred thousand dollars, became as suddenly worth what it was before. Nothing. And taxes to pay. I had paid the taxes and the other expenses for some years, but I dropped the Tennessee land there, and have never taken any interest in it since, pecuniarily or otherwise, until yesterday. I had supposed, until yesterday, that Orion had frittered away the last acre, and indeed that was his own impression. But a gentleman arrived yesterday from Tennessee, and brought a map showing that by a correction of the ancient surveys we still own a thousand acres, in a coal district, out of the hundred thousand acres which my father left us when he died in 1847. The gentleman brought a proposition. Also he brought a reputable and well-to-do citizen of New York. The proposition was that the Tennessean gentleman should sell that land, that the New York gentleman should pay all the expenses and fight all the lawsuits, in case any should turn up, and that of such profit as might eventuate, the Tennessean gentleman should take a third, the New Yorker a third, and Sam Moffat and his sister and I, who are surviving heirs, the remaining third. This time I hope we shall get rid of the Tennessee land for good and all, and never hear of it again. I came east in January, 1867. Orion remained in Carson City perhaps a year longer. Then he sold his $12,000 house and its furniture for 3500 in greenbacks at about 60% discount. He and his wife took passage in the steamer for home in Keokuk. About 1871 or 72 they came to New York. Orion had been trying to make a living in the law ever since he had arrived from the Pacific coast, but he had secured only two cases. Those he was to try free of charge, but the possible result will never be known, because the parties settled the cases out of court without his help. Orion got a job as proofreader on the New York Evening Post at ten dollars a week. By and by he came to Hartford and wanted me to get him a place as reporter on a Hartford paper. Here was a chance to try my scheme again, and I did it. I made him go to the Hartford Evening Post without any letter of introduction, and proposed to scrub and sweep and do all sorts of things for nothing, on the plea that he didn't need money but only needed work, and that that was what he was pining for. Within six weeks he was on the editorial staff of that paper at twenty dollars a week, and he was worth the money. He was presently called for by some other paper at better wages, but I made him go to the post people and tell them about it. They stood the raise and kept him. It was the pleasantest berth he had ever had in his life. It was an easy berth. He was in every way comfortable. But ill luck came. It was bound to come. A new Republican daily was to be started in a New England city by a stock company of well-to-do politicians, and they offered him the chief editorship at three thousand a year. He was eager to accept. My beseechings and reasonings went for nothing. I said, You are as weak as water. Those people will find it out right away. They will easily see that you have no backbone, that they can deal with you as they would deal with a slave. You may last six months, but not longer. Then they will not dismiss you as they would dismiss a gentleman. They will fling you out as they would fling out an intruding tramp. It happened just so. Then he and his wife migrated to Keokuk once more. Orion wrote from there that he was not resuming the law, that he thought that what his health needed was the open air, in some sort of outdoor occupation, that his father-in-law had a strip of ground on the river border a mile above Keokuk with some sort of a house on it, and his idea was to buy that place and start a chicken farm and provide Keokuk with chickens and eggs and perhaps butter, but I don't know whether you can raise butter on a chicken farm or not. He said the place could be had for three thousand dollars cash, and I sent the money. He began to raise chickens, and he made a detailed monthly report to me whereby it appeared that he was able to work off his chickens on the Keokuk people at a dollar and a quarter a pair, but it also appeared that it cost a dollar and sixty cents to raise the pair. This did not seem to discourage Orion, and so I let it go. Meantime he was borrowing a hundred dollars per month of me regularly, month by month. Now to show Orion's stern and rigid business ways, and he really prided himself on his large business capacities, the moment he received the advance of a hundred dollars at the beginning of each month, 
He always sent me his note for the amount, and with it he sent, out of that money, three months' interest on the hundred dollars at six per cent per annum, these notes being always for three months. As I say, he always sent a detailed statement of the month's profit and loss on the chickens, at least the month's loss on the chickens, and this detailed statement included the various items of expense, corn for the chickens, boots for himself, and so on, even car fares and the weekly contribution of ten cents to help out the missionaries who were trying to damn the Chinese after a plan not satisfactory to those people. I think the poultry experiment lasted about a year, possibly two years. It had then cost me six thousand dollars. Orion returned to the law business, and I suppose he remained in that harness off and on for the succeeding quarter of a century, but so far as my knowledge goes he was only a lawyer in name, and had no clients. My mother died in her eighty-eighth year in the summer of 1890. She had saved some money, and she left it to me, because it had come from me. I gave it to Orion, and he said, with thanks, that I had supported him long enough, and now he was going to relieve me of that burden, and would also hope to pay back some of that expense, and maybe the whole of it. Accordingly, he proceeded to use up that money in building a considerable addition to the house, with the idea of taking boarders and getting rich. We need not dwell upon this venture. It was another of his failures. His wife tried hard to make the scheme succeed, and if anybody could have made it succeed, she would have done it. She was a good woman, and was greatly liked. She had a practical side, and she would have made that boarding-house lucrative if circumstances had not been against her. Orion had other projects for recouping me, but as they always required capital, I stayed out of them, and they did not materialize. Once he wanted to start a newspaper. It was a ghastly idea, and I squelched it with a promptness that was almost rude. Then he invented a wood-sawing machine, and patched it together himself, and he really sawed wood with it. It was ingenious, it was capable, and it would have made a comfortable little fortune for him. But just at the wrong time Providence interfered again. Orion applied for a patent, and found that the same machine had already been patented, and had gone into business, and was thriving. Presently the State of New York offered a fifty-thousand-dollar prize for a practical method of navigating the Erie Canal with steam canal boats. Orion worked at that thing for two or three years, invented and completed a method, and was once more ready to reach out and seize upon imminent wealth when somebody pointed out a defect. His steam canal boat could not be used in the winter time, and in the summer time the commotion its wheels would make in the water would wash away the State of New York on both sides. Innumerable were Orion's projects for acquiring the means to pay off the debt to me. These projects extended straight through the succeeding thirty years, but in every case they failed. During all those thirty years his well-established honesty kept him in offices of trust where other people's money had to be taken care of, but where no salary was paid. He was treasurer of all the benevolent institutions. He took care of the money and other property of widows and orphans. He never lost a cent for anybody, and never made one for himself. Every time he changed his religion, the church of his new faith was glad to get him, made him treasurer at once, and at once he stopped the graft and the leaks in that church. He exhibited a facility in changing his political complexion that was a marvel to the whole community. Once the following curious thing happened, and he wrote me all about it himself. One morning he was a Republican and upon invitation he agreed to make a campaign speech at the Republican mass meeting that night. He prepared the speech. After luncheon he became a Democrat, and agreed to write a score of exciting mottoes to be painted upon the transparencies which the Democrats would carry in their torchlight procession that night. He wrote these shouting Democratic mottoes during the afternoon, and they occupied so much of his time that it was night before he had a chance to change his politics again so he actually made a rousing Republican campaign speech in the open air while his Democratic transparencies passed by in front of him to the joy of every witness present. He was a most strange creature, but in spite of his eccentricities he was beloved all his life in whatsoever community he lived, and he was also held in high esteem, for at bottom he was a sterling man. About twenty-five years ago, along there somewhere, I suggested to Orion that he write an autobiography. I asked him to try to tell the straight truth in it, 
to refrain from exhibiting himself in creditable attitudes exclusively, and to honorably set down all the incidents of his life which he had found interesting to him, including those which were burned into his memory because he was ashamed of them. I said that this had never been done, and that if he could do it, his autobiography would be a most valuable piece of literature. I said I was offering him a job which I could not duplicate in my own case, but I would cherish the hope that he might succeed with it. I recognize now that I was trying to saddle upon him an impossibility. I have been dictating this autobiography of mine daily for three months. I have thought of fifteen hundred or two thousand incidents in my life which I am ashamed of, but I have not gotten one of them to consent to go on paper yet. I think that that stock will still be complete and unimpaired when I finish these memoirs, if I ever finish them. I believe that if I should put in all or any of those incidents, I should be sure to strike them out when I came to revise this book. Orion wrote his autobiography and sent it to me, but great was my disappointment, and my vexation, too. In it he was constantly making a hero of himself, exactly as I should have done and am doing now, and he was constantly forgetting to put in the episodes which placed him in an unheroic light. I knew several incidents of his life which were distinctly and painfully unheroic, but when I came across them in his autobiography, they had changed color. They had turned themselves inside out, and were things to be intemperately proud of. In my dissatisfaction I destroyed a considerable part of that autobiography, but in what remains there are passages which are interesting, and I shall quote from them here and there and now and then, as I go along. While we were living in Vienna in 1898, a cablegram came from Keokuk announcing Orion's death. He was seventy-two years old. He had gone down to the kitchen in the early hours of a bitter December morning. He had built a fire, and had then sat down at a table to write something. And there he died, with a pencil in his hand, and resting against the paper in the middle of an unfinished word, an indication that his release from the captivity of a long and troubled and pathetic and unprofitable life was mercifully swift and painless. Dictated in 1904 A quarter of a century ago I was visiting John Hay at Whitlaw Reed's house in New York, which Hay was occupying for a few months, while Reed was absent on a holiday in Europe. Temporarily, also, Hay was editing Reed's paper, the New York Tribune. I remember two incidents of that Sunday visit particularly well. I had known John Hay a good many years. I had known him when he was an obscure young editorial writer on the Tribune, in Horace Greeley's time, earning three or four times the salary he got, considering the high character of the work which came from his pen. In those early days he was a picture to look at, for beauty of feature, perfection of form, and grace of carriage and movement. He had a charm about him, of a sort quite unusual to my western ignorance and inexperience, a charm of manner, intonation, apparently native and unstudied elocution, and all that, the groundwork of it native, the case of it, the polish of it, the winning naturalness of it, acquired in Europe, where he had been chargé d'affaires some time at the court of Vienna. He was joyous and cordial, a most pleasant comrade. One of the two incidents above referred to as marking that visit was this. In trading remarks concerning our ages, I confessed to forty-two, and Hay to forty. Then he asked if I had begun to write my autobiography, and I said I hadn't. He said I ought to begin at once, and that I had already lost two years. Then he said in substance this. At forty a man reaches the top of the hill of life, and starts down on the sunset side. The ordinary man, the average man, not to particularize too closely, and say the commonplace man, has at that age succeeded or failed. In either case, he has lived all of his life that is likely to be worth recording. Also, in either case, the life lived is worth setting down, and cannot fail to be interesting if he comes as near to telling the truth about himself as he can and he will tell the truth in spite of himself, for his facts and his fictions will work loyally together for the protection of the reader. Each fact and each fiction will be a dab of paint, each will fall in its right place, and together they will paint his portrait. Not the portrait he thinks they are painting, but his real portrait, the inside of him, the soul of him, his character. 
Without intending to lie, he will lie all the time, not bluntly, consciously, not dully unconsciously, but half-consciously, consciousness in twilight, a soft and gentle and merciful twilight which makes his general form comely, with his virtuous prominences and projections discernible, and his ungracious ones in shadow. His truths will be recognizable as truths. His modifications of facts, which would tell against him, will go for nothing. The reader will see the fact through the film, and know his man. There is a subtle and devilish something or other about autobiographical composition that defeats all the writer's attempts to paint his portrait his way. Hay meant that he and I were ordinary, average, commonplace people, and I did not resent my share of the verdict, but nursed my wound in silence. His idea that we had finished our work in life, passed the summit, and were westward bound downhill, with me two years ahead of him, and neither of us with anything further to do as benefactors to mankind, was all a mistake. I had written four books then, possibly five. I have been drowning the world in literary wisdom ever since, volume after volume. Since that day's sun went down, he has been the historian of Mr. Lincoln, and his book will never perish. He has been ambassador, brilliant orator, competent, and admirable Secretary of State. Mark Twain. To be continued.